So far in this semester, we've worked with subsets of Euclidean space. And Euclidean spaces have a notion of a distance between two points. Manifolds also have a notion of a distance between two points, but we haven't yet spoken about what that is. And what you have to do is you have to use the metric that a manifold obtains from Euclidean space and then connect two different points by the shortest path that remains on that manifold. And that defines a distance on a manifold. And we may or may not talk about that later on. But we should ask ourselves, what's the general structure that we need to talk about distance between two points in an arbitrary set? That's the motivation for the following definition of a metric space. So metric space consists of, as any definition, we always have data, and then that data has to satisfy a bunch of conditions. So metric space consists of a set, which we write for now as x, and a function from x cross x to the set of real numbers, which we denote by d. And sometimes this function is also called a metric or a distance function. And these two things have to satisfy a bunch of conditions. What are they? First of all, we demand that the distance from x to y, if it happens to be zero, then that means the two points were initially the same points to begin with. So this is called non-degeneracy. Two, the distance is symmetric, dxy equals dyx for all x and y. This is called the symmetric property. And finally, the distance satisfies a sort of triangle inequality that says the distance between two points is always smaller than if I took two paths to get to, that, to get to those two points. You might say, wait, wait, wait. Shouldn't I at least demand that the distance is a positive number? So that's a fact. And it actually follows from these three assumptions. dxy is always non-negative. And the reason for this follows from the symmetric condition and this um, and part C, the triangle inequality. And this is because we've just proven that dxx is equal to 0. But by the triangle inequality, if I place a y here, then I know that I get something like this. And by symmetry, these two things are the same. So again, this is 2 dxy. And canceling out the 2, we see that dxy is greater than or equal to 0. So I think a lot of the times you'll see definitions, you'll actually see something like these two conditions are included, but they actually follow from, uh, from b and c. So let's give some examples. The first e immediate examples are um, things that we're familiar with. Um, R, with its usual notion of distance, the set of, for instance, rational numbers. Um, they also have a distance that is the same as the distance in R. Um, some other examples are Rn, using the norm. And the norm gives rise to a distance satisfying these properties, as we've shown earlier in the course. But there are also more exotic examples, examples that don't just come from subsets of Euclidean space. For instance, if you have any compact subset of Rn, you can look at the set of continuous functions on that compact subset. And f is continuous. With this assumption, and it's really important that we have a compact subset and a continuous function, we can define the distance, and we'll call this the soup distance, between two functions f and g to be the maximum distance between these two functions. 
So it's the supremum over all x and k of the distance between those two functions, the pointwise distance in R. And it follows from these two assumptions that this soup is actually equal to the max, because for a continuous function on a compact set, we know that the maximum distance is always achieved. Because the image of a compact subset of Rn is compact because the function is continuous. So one of the reasons um, that I, I write this metric and I put a subscript soup here is because we'll actually have a different metric on the set of continuous functions that is very important in the following sense. If we look at the following example, imagine you have the function 0, right? And if you take the function 1, then obviously the distance from this function to 0 is 1. But what if instead we took another function? Let's say this function is 0 in almost, you know, in many, many places, and then we suddenly decide to make it reach 1 at some point, almost like a Gaussian, you can say. And again, we're assuming that everything is on a compact domain, so I should cut this off at some point. Now, with this example, let's call this f, what's the distance between 0 with respect to the soup norm and f? Well, the maximum distance between these functions point-wise is still 1. So even though it looks like this function is very close to 0, it's actually not that close, and it's still a distance 1 away from 0. So because of this, we can define another metric. On this same space, continuous functions on a compact domain, or specifically, I guess, when k is of the form let's say, in a closed interval from A to B. We can define um, this integral distance to be the area between the two curves. So all we do is we take the difference between these two functions, and then we calculate each of their separations, and then we integrate over that. So we're not just calculating the maximum, we're actually integrating this entire distance function over all x. And with respect to this metric, which is a metric by the way, you should check that all of these are metrics, then the distance between 0 and f is quite small. And that's because if we can, if, and we know that we can describe bump functions now that are zero everywhere except on a neighborhood of, epsilon, of radius, let's say, um, one half epsilon, and we know that the height is maximized by one, then this distance is at most epsilon, in fact, less than or equal to epsilon, for any epsilon. So we can choose such an f that depends on epsilon in this fashion. So this is just to illustrate that a particular set can have many different metrics. And we'll give another example of this even in finite dimensions where you have different metrics on the same set. So let's look at Rn. And Rn will equip with a metric which we denote by D subscript P where P for the time being is any number from 1 to and not including infinity. And we define dp to be the distance between x and y to actually be equal to, this seems like a complicated formula, but it reduces to things that we're quite familiar with. Let's take the components, let's take the distance between those components, and we'll raise that to the pth power. And then, once we're all done, we'll take the 1 over pth root. It's not at all obvious that this is a metric, and your book actually spends quite a long time proving it. But we should notice, in some special cases, this reduces to things that we might be familiar with. For instance, if p equals 2, this is just the usual metric 
on Rn that we've been describing. When P equals 1, what does this look like? We can get a, a great idea of what this uh, metric is doing by looking at the unit sphere in Rn with respect to these metrics. So with respect to any metric space, we can define a sphere. The sphere, for instance, of radius r at any point x is defined to be the point, the set of the points y in x that are a distance r away from x, such that distance xy is equal to r. And this defines a sphere of radius r centered at x. In this case, we have a vector space, and we can look at what the unit sphere is at 0. So when we do that, let's say this is negative 1, this is 1, and here we also have the unit coordinates. Let me draw this out so it's much clearer what this looks like. When p equals 1, all we're doing is we're calculating this distance. If you wanted to, we can solve for um, y, for example, and what we'll get is the unit sphere looks something like this. Looks almost like a, a diamond. So this is the unit sphere for p equals 1. Perhaps it's a little surprising. What does the unit sphere look like when p equals 2? That we already know, right? That is what we usually call the unit sphere. And then what happens if p gets much, much larger? Well, you can test this out, for instance, you can plot this in Mathematica, or you can think a little bit um, if you've ever looked at what happens to um, x to the kth power or something like that um, as k increases or decreases. You'll notice that what happens is, is that this line hugs this square closer and closer. And you get something that looks like it's getting closer and closer to that square at the boundary. So this is for p uh, much, much larger than, let's say, 2. We're, I mean, much, much larger just means larger, <laughs> right? Um, so let me write p equals 2 here. So these are the different spheres with respect to several different kinds of metrics on R2. So a given set can have many different metrics on it, and some of them might have very different properties. Um, and we're, what we're going to do is we're going to study the um, collection of, met of metric spaces with different notions of distances and their continuous or different kinds of functions between them.